Mike, have you heard that old adage about bringing a knife to a gunfight? Yes. Watch today. We're going to see it. Hi everyone, welcome to today's Badge Cam Lesson here at Active Self Protection. I'm your host, John Carrillo. I'm your co-host, Mike Bulliver. Today's video comes to us from scenic Danville, California. Today's video was brought to us by Mantis. The Mantis family of products is integral to ASP staff building handgun and carbine skills and are your most economical and fastest path to improvement in your skills too. Whether you choose the X10, the Laser Academy, the Blackbeard, or use them all in concert, they will help your practice be more effective, efficient, and fun. Go check them out, pick up a unit, and thank them for sponsoring today's video. Multiple people have called 911 because this guy up in the corner here is throwing rocks over the fence at cars on the freeway. They're going to send an officer. He is going to make contact with the guy. We have badge cam audio of their interaction. Let's listen in and see what happens. Hey buddy, come here for me real quick. Come here, come here, come here. You, you're jaywalking now. Get over here. What company is this? Tom, I need cover. Come here. Come here. We're not playing this game, dude. How did I play this game either? You're jaywalking, you're throwing okay, rocks. Hey, who are you? Officer Hall at the damn yeah, police. Where? Come over here. What? Authority of what? No, don't fucking touch me. Dude, come touch on. me and see what's up. Touch me and see what's up. Drop the knife. Oh. Drop the knife. Kill me. Drop the knife. <laughs> Someone shots fired. Tom one. Suspect down, code three medical, Camino Ramon, Sycamore Valley. I need all additional units. I just need scene control. That SFPD officer's Tesla has a front facing camera. You can see it recorded here as well. You can see the guy backing up and then he flicks the knife open and threatens with it. Then the officer draws his gun and he starts walking him down. When he starts walking him down, the officer shoots him one time in the face with a 40 Smith and Wesson. And that was incredibly effective at ending that threat. This guy ended up uh, dying of his injuries right there. We have actually a street camera of it as well. You see the officer wanting to talk to him. I again, investigating a crime here of throwing rocks onto the freeway at passing cars. Now the guy is, is jaywalking in the middle of a very busy intersection. Uh, now, if you go read the news story, I've linked it in the description. This officer, I actually have put the DA's report in a link in the description where he declares this justified. That said, this police officer in the interim was actually convicted of manslaughter in a separate incident, not this incident at all, but in a separate incident where he had shot somebody after pulling somebody over and that was determined to be manslaughter. Our officer is doing six years in that particular case. Again, this particular case, he was uh, shown to be justified by the district attorney. Again, uh, this man known in the community, he was known to have significant mental health issues, uh, but nothing justifies what he did here. I mean, I know we can talk about relations between the public and police all we want, but I mean, like, you pull a knife on a cop and you charge towards him, what, what do you think is going to happen? So let's be clear at the outset here, Mike, that this is not some jackbooted thug, uh, you know, uh, oppressing the populace. This is an officer investigating a crime, somebody throwing rocks on the freeway that absolutely could be a significant threat of great bodily injury to people driving by on the freeway at 70 miles an hour. And then when he comes upon the guy, the guy is jaywalking in the middle of a busy major intersection. This isn't a run of the mill jaywalking either. So he's investigating crime. He has every right to stop this guy. Guy matches the description of who he was told. So this isn't some random encounter here where the cop is being a jerk. Yeah, we've had a couple like this, not in the recent past, John, where, you know, it, it, I think people questioned, hey, what was the whole purpose of the stop in the first place? This is not one of those by any means. Um, what this guy is doing, throwing probably sizable rocks onto, onto the freeway when cars are going by, 
it's California. They're probably doing 80, 85 miles an hour. Uh, that rock could absolutely kill somebody. So there's probably four or five potential felonies that he's guilty of at this point that he could be charged with. So, yeah, he needs to act, the, the officer. He needs to act now. And he's active decisively because we can't look and being in the middle of a, of a four lane divided highway like this at a traffic light is not great. People are looking at their phones. People are yelling at their kids and not paying attention. You absolutely can get run over. Um, so I think everything he did here was pretty much spot on. And, and listen, this is a very different situation. We just recently had a video on the channel out of Morris, Illinois, where we said, hey, man, this woman, you know, advancing on officers with a knife. Gosh, could you have done something else? This is a very different situation. We still have a person advancing on officers with a knife. Very different situation here though, and this guy is belligerent, he is non-compliant, he is advancing with ill intent, and he has threatened with the knife. He said, touch me again and find out, and then taps his chest and says, go ahead, kill me, in a threatening manner. So, so remember, facts really matter in this kind of stuff, and understanding how the facts fit the principles is really the key to, to justified use of deadly force. Clearly in this case, a guy, you know, the officer is right to be doing what he's doing. He's right to detain this guy. He has a right to be where he is. And this man pulling a knife on him and threatening him with it is absolutely evidence of a deadly threat. Yeah, I would love to know more about this other encounter that he had where he killed someone and was found guilty of manslaughter. Because in this situation, what I'm seeing is an officer who knows exactly what he's doing he already knows all the things. Am I here doing what I'm doing legally? Is this detention legal? These are all questions you have to have sorted out. And after enough years on the job, you just sort of, you can do it almost automatically. He knows what he's doing. He knows everything he's doing is is legal. There's no illegal detention. There's no question about anything. And he doesn't, he doesn't fire his firearm until the guy stops retreating and starts walking him down, as you said. Um, and he just strikes me as an officer who knows exactly what to do and what not to do in this moment. Um, so bravo to him for that. I also want to pay attention to the badge cam. There's an interesting bit here in that it's kind of hard to see on the badge cam that the guy is walking him down. That, that it kind of looked like he was stationary there. So there are some limitations of badge cam. I think it was there, but it was much harder to see than it was in the surveillance footage. So that's an interesting bit to see. Secondarily, I know some people are gonna question the face shot. Uh, the fact of the matter is the officer shot this man in the face. Well, well, listen, deadly force is deadly force is deadly force. So, you know, just like we say, don't shoot somebody in the leg because the chance of stopping them is lower, but the chance of doing deadly harm is not any lower. So generally we would say shoot in the high center chest because that has the highest probability of a hit and a high probability of stopping. But if you're, you're really good with your gun and you understand how to use it, especially as this is short distance, five to seven feet is what the district attorney rec, uh, you know, uh, estimated that this distance was. Uh, you know, again, if he's a deadly threat to you, shoot him and shut him off and sh hitting somebody in the electrical system is the fastest way to do that. So what are we looking at uh, here, John? Exactly. We're looking at a very large, probably very, very capable uh, adult male with a sizable knife. He has made his intentions clear. This officer can't retreat for, for all day long. He can't walk away and let this guy walk away. He's obviously a danger to everybody around him. He's proven that by throwing rocks at free cars in the freeway and by drawing a knife on a uniformed police officer. This officer has doesn't have a lot of other options. And if he does go for center of mass, which would have been a fine decision on his part, if he does do that, there very rarely does someone is someone disabled from a single round to the center of mass you know that it takes the body a while to figure out that bad things have happened and to actually stop the person from doing what they're doing if this guy had been determined to do so and john you know this better than me you've practiced you know uh fighting with knives and defending against knives the heck this whole channel was started on you know on, on the uh, on the idea of how do we defend against a knife attack right so there, there is every opportunity in the world for this suspect, this offender, to get inside of this cop zone right now and stick him a number of times. He might get shot in the process, but not before he is able to do probably pretty significant damage to this officer. So he really doesn't have a lot of options here. And, and listen, that's because of his aggressive nature, right? His aggressive uh, demeanor is what I really meant there, that you know the, the, the nature of this threat was aggressive. And so because of that, Man, that was really there. I want to be very careful. I was not referring to his nature there as a person or anything like that. The nature of the aggression that he showed was absolutely present there. 
So now the officer has got to figure out what do I do from here? He said he didn't you know, immediately render aid or holster his pistol because some guy is screaming at him, why'd you shoot him? And there's traffic all over the place and I don't know, you know what I'm gonna do in this particular case, but I don't feel safe to holster up my pistol. Now let's think about our Tesla driving SFPD officer here, okay? So, so in the area, not this department, whatever, and things get going and she sees an officer involved shooting, comes and sticks her car in front. But one of the things that I really love about this SFPD officer's approach, Mike, is that number one, she approached from a long way away. She, she gave significant space for the officer's safety, put her hands out wide, identified herself, and asked what she could do to help. And I think a private citizen could probably do about the same if they approach from the same perspective. Give space, hands wide, tell the officer who they are and ask for help. That was a really good approach on her part. Absolutely. I, I've had to do this a couple times in more than a couple times, several times uh, when I was uh, active duty law enforcement. And I would always say, police, 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 I'm here to help. And I'd keep saying that until I know that they acknowledged what I was saying and saw me. And I would have my hands absolutely wide open and out in front of me like this. I couldn't get my hands any more wide open if I tried. The idea being he can, he or she, the officer can clearly see that I have nothing in my hands. And I, right now, especially after a shooting like this, this officer probably has a little bit of dumb brain. You know, he, he's, it's kind of like dealing with a, a, a low, what is it? A low emotion, um, you know, clear thinking or not a muddled thinking person where you have to use very basic crisis communication. As a private citizen, um, it's between you and your God. If you stop to help a law enforcement officer who's just been in a shooting or is in a serious situation, only you can make that decision. But do it, if you do do it, do it carefully. If you're law enforcement, I personally, I expect you to stop and help if you're a fellow officer, even for a different agency. But like John said, nice, big, open hands. I'm here to help. I'm police. Do you need help? Whatever you want to say, but make it clear and concise and make sure they know you're not a threat. Yeah. And... I really think here, her Tesla, the front camera here, really important because like I said earlier in the analysis, now watch our perp is backing up. He says, don't touch me, don't touch me. Then he comes forward with the knife and then taps his chest and says, shoot me. And and that and says that in a threatening manner, right? You heard it on the, uh, on the badge cam, but as he's walking forward with a knife in his hand in a threatening manner, then, then this to me is, is just imminently justifiable conduct. But, but I will note, it's much easier to see in silhouette here from the side than it was on the officer's badge cam. It's a reminder to all of us that there are limitations of what the badge cam shows us, limitations of what the surveillance camera shows us. When we have both, we really get a better view. Yeah, for example, when you opened this up, you said it was a busy intersection. If you look at the badge cam, you hardly see any cars at all. So if you said, hey, I was afraid to back up, it was a busy intersection, and all you have is his badge cam perspective, you're not seeing all the cars behind him queued up or trying to get around traffic or trying to go or whatever. And again, like I said, somebody on their phone, somebody yelling at their kids, somebody adjusting the radio or the air conditioning who isn't paying attention for you know five seconds could run you over. I think it's important to note here, John, I counted four full steps the officer took back, retreating backwards. I wanna reiterate something. Had this offender been determined, and even if he'd been shot in the chest a couple of times, he could have gotten to that officer very easily. There's a very small gap for him to close. And John, as you know, you can speak more intelligently on this than I can. Having an, have him having an edged weapon is a scenario for being cut, potentially cut to ribbons. So I think, again, I want to reiterate, this officer really didn't have a lot of options. Look, at the end of the day, what do we what do we have police for right if not this if not to deal with a with a person who's having some sort of mental issue who's throwing rocks at cars in the freeway and threatening people with knives this is why we pay our police to do their job this is why we train them now i don't know what happened in the other incident but in this incident i can say this officer did what he could to try to avoid taking a life at the end of the day he had to pull the trigger and cover his ass